doesn't waste a lot of time or a lot of words. He gets right to the action and moves right along. But uh, I want to ask you a question before we start here. How many Gospels are there? One Gospel. Good. All right. We have one theologian in the crowd. There's one Gospel. Now there are four folks that retell us the gospel, recount the gospel, but there is only one gospel. It's not the gospel of Mark or the gospel of John, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's John and Luke and Matthew and Mark who recount the ministry of Jesus and his life as they saw it and while he was on this earth. So, if I were doing this 20 years ago, we would spend probably the, the whole message today with me giving you all the proofs for why Mark wrote it and all the proofs for when he wrote it and all the proofs for why it's true. But I've pretty much become bored with all that stuff. I did it so much. Uh, just suffice it to say, Mark wrote it and yes, it's all true because it's God's Word. And, and we can just proceed from there and save you a lot of tedium. Now, as I said, uh, we do have four different Gospels, and, and I think the reason for that is that God, who of course designed us and created us, uh, knows that we will identify with different people, with different ways of presentation. And you've all uh, read about how, you know, if four people or six people or however many people uh, witness an accident, each will tell a little different story of seeing the same thing. They will emphasize uh, a different fact or that. Uh, it, it's just the way it is. And I think that's what we have happening with our uh, four gospel writers. Another reason we have four is because there's an old rule of uh, speaking or writing or whatever it is, and it simply says this, it says, know your audience. We need to know our audience. One of the, the uh, most useful exercises I ever uh, had to partake in uh, when I was in, in a seminary was you had to pick a passage of Scripture, and you could pick any passage you wanted, but then you had to write three messages from that same pack, passage, and one of the messages was to be delivered to the youth group, another was to be delivered to the Lions Club, and another was to be delivered to the Sunday morning group. And it's amazing how the message was the same, but how differently you packaged it to present it to those audiences. And we have our gospel writers uh, doing the same thing. Uh, Matthew writes primarily to a Jewish audience. That's why when Matthew begins, he starts with the genealogy and, and ties Jesus into uh, everyone that came before him and so on. Luke is writing actually to an individual, uh, a Roman official by the name of Theophilus. And you can look at the beginning of Luke and he, he tells us that. And uh, John, of course, he's writing to Gentiles around the area of Ephesus. And later on he writes uh, the book of Revelation and the seven churches that are in that area. We've talked about that. So who does Mark write to? Mark writes to basically a Gentile audience living in Rome. And he writes about 65 AD. Now why is that important? Well, it's important because of what the, the Christians were experiencing in Rome at the time. Uh, Nero was emperor, and uh, he had some good things about him, but he also really went bad towards the end. And in 64, Rome burned. Now, it's hard to imagine the conflagration that went on, as literally 80% of the city burned to the ground. It'd be like saying 80% of Portland was burned to the ground. And tens of thousands of people died. It was a horrible thing. And some thought Nero might have had a hand in that. Well, what does any good politician do when he's on the hook for something? Somebody else. Exactly. Exactly. So Nero uh, blames the Christians. And he says the Christians are responsible for the fire. And he began to uh, really uh, spearhead a great persecution against the Christians. And there's all ma manner of... Uh, mayhem that he inflicted upon them, cruel deaths and all those things. And, and so this is what the, the environment they're living in. Now we talk about 
uh, the chaotic environment we live in now in the 21st century. And we see all kinds of senseless deaths and all kinds of things going on. And so we're not a whole lot different than those people living in Rome in the first century. So that brings us to a point. Mark is characterized by its brevity and its urgency. You know, he doesn't say anything about where Jesus came from. He doesn't give us any background of who John the Baptist is. He just starts out, bang, these people are here. This is who they are. This is what they're doing. Because the folks in Rome didn't have time to fool around. They didn't want a bunch of exhaustive proofs of this and proofs of that. They wanted to know, who is Jesus? Is Jesus who he said he is in light of the suffering we're going through? And you have probably all asked yourselves that same question. You may not have been suffering to the extent of you were being martyred, but you're suffering from an extended sickness, you're suffering from lack of employment, you're suffering from uh, a divorce, you're suffering from whatever it is, and it goes on and on and on, and it seems like there's not going to be an end to it. And you, you say to yourself or you say to God, if you're God, why don't you do something? And that's exactly where these folks were. And so Mark comes on the scene and he gets right to it and he's going to tell them who Jesus is. There's a, a Greek word that uh, appears in Mark and it's, it's euthus and what it means is it means immediately or straight away. And it's interesting because in the book of Mark it appears 42 times. A little short book of Mark, 42 times. In all the rest of the New Testament it appears only 12 times. So you see, that's what Mark's all about. He's an action guy. He says, let's get with it. We're going to do something here. So let's jump into it and, and see what we can uh, learn today. And remember what I told you last week? If you will, as we go through the book of Mark, kind of pay attention to the things that Jesus gets excited about. Whether he gets excited in a positive sense or a negative sense. And then compare them to our lives. And what are the things that we get excited about? What is it that really ticks you off as a Christian? Is it the things that really bothered Jesus? Or not? I don't know. And, and what are the things that really uh, grab you and make you bring a smile to your face? Is it the same things that brought a smile to Jesus' face? I don't know. But we'll see as we go along. So the identity of Jesus. You heard Bono up there. And he said he's the Son of God. And that he is. And this is one of the two most important questions you will ever have to answer. And Gail sang for us, so I'll lift up the name of Jesus. Okay. Who is Jesus Christ? The first of the two most important questions you will ever have to answer. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 and 17, we have Peter's uh, famous confession. You know, Jesus asked him, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed to you, this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Who do you say he is? The most important question you'll ever have to answer. He's Jesus Christ. Now, we throw that around uh, so casually, I do too, when I say we, I mean we, uh, that we, we lose the sense for it. You know, Christ isn't just something tacked onto his first name. Christ is the Messiah, that's what it means. In Hebrew it means Messiah, the promised one, the Savior, the Son of God, that all through the Old Testament had been prophesied that he's coming again. So every time he's called Jesus the Messiah, you can translate that if you want, and maybe it's, it would be more effective for you. Jesus, my Savior. Or Jesus, the Savior of the world. However you want to phrase that. Because that's what it means. He is the Messiah. And then Mark goes on, here, we're in verse 1, and he says, He's the Son of God. Did he call? <laughs> oh. For a minute there, I thought I heard him, heard him calling. <laughs> he's the Son of God, He's the Savior, and there are no other options to get to heaven. 
You know, Luke tells us over in, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there's no other name under heaven given by which we might be saved. So how many others? None. Zero. Jesus Christ is the only way. Now I want you to notice, how did Peter know this? Did he figure it out because he was so intellectually astute? Did he know it because he was such a sensitive individual and he could just tell? No. He knew this because God revealed it to him. You didn't know this by flesh and blood. You know this because God, my Father, has revealed it to you. Recognizing Jesus as the Messiah is a supernatural thing. You can't get it without the intervention of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you do name Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's because the Holy Spirit has brought you to that point in your life where you recognize that fact. You know, Paul makes it so plain to us in Ephesians uh, chapter 2. He, he says, you know, by grace are you saved through faith. And that's not of yourselves. You didn't conjure up the grace. You didn't conjure up the faith. God graciously condescended to save us. And so he made us alive with Christ. That's huge. That is good news. And what does the word gospel mean? It means good news. The good news is that Jesus Christ has come and called us to himself. Good news. Our friend Luke says it this way in chapter 2 of his gospel. Fear not! For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Now, it's a Christmas verse, isn't it? We read that at Christmas when we read the, the story of the shepherds. But that's a forever verse. Good news, for I bring you great joy that will be for all people. Good ones, bad ones, short ones, fat ones, tall ones, skinny ones, black ones, green ones, brown ones. That's huge. That's wonderful good news. So here we are in the midst of all this chaos. Here the, these Christians are in Rome and many of them are being killed and tortured and maimed and all those things. And Mark writes to them, there's good news. There's a Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. And there's more than just what's happening to you here and now. Well, God, in his infinite wisdom, sent a man to prepare the way for Jesus Christ, to announce his coming. And of course, we all know him as John the Baptist. And we see there in verses 2 through 8, which Michael read for us, how he appeared and what he did. So why did he need to do that? Hadn't the Messiah's coming been announced for hundreds of thousands or thousands of years already all through the Old Testament don't we have the prophets crying out in fact it's Isaiah who said prepare the way make the path straight I will tell you why well it is the internal witness of the Holy Spirit to our hearts that causes us to believe. It is the external call that first gets our attention. Okay. Now the external call will fall on deaf ears unless the Holy Spirit is working internally in our hearts. But as he begins to work internally in our hearts, he sends someone to tell us about the Messiah. It could be a friend, it could be a neighbor, it could be a preacher, it could be whomever it is. In this case, it was the, the man we know as John the Baptist. In fact, Paul says it 
in, chap in Romans chapter 10. I'll start, I'll start here in verse 12. He says, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, and the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Okay? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, but here's the problem. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? They need to hear. Now, I'm not crazy about the way they translated that, preaching. Because that kind of gives us the idea, if we're, if we're reading this, okay, so the pastor gets to tell them about Jesus. Or if, if I think my, my neighbor's open to hearing about the Lord, I'll call the pastor and see if he'll come over and tell them about Jesus. Or come over and preach to them. Yeah, you know? Well, we know that's, that's crazy, but we kind of get that idea. But the word there the, is, is keruso, and it, it, you, can, you can translate it to proclaim, you can translate it to speak, you can translate it to preach. But it's basically, it's, it's, it's proclaiming something to someone. It's something all of you can do. You can all tell somebody about Jesus. And by the way, if you want to remember that word, uh, keruso, so you can, you know, you're a little bit of your Greek, just remember the, I believe he was the tenor, the great opera singer, Caruso. Is that right? Well, Caruso, Caruso, he proclaimed, he sang out. It worked for me, maybe it'll work for you. <laughs> maybe not. So anyway, John comes and he proclaims that Christ is coming. But now notice, Mark anchors this whole event in the scriptures. Back in, first, uh, in uh, uh, verse 2, he, he, in 1 he says the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Then what does he do immediately? He says, it, as it is written in the scriptures. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet. He anchors his proclamation in scripture. Now, some today think, well, that's kind of passe. We don't want to uh, force the Bible on people and all that sort of thing. Well, that's all you've got. You've got the Holy Spirit and you've got the Holy Word. And you can share that with people. You might be surprised at how hungry they actually are to hear God's Word confidently proclaimed. So as it is written... This is always how we authenticate any message. Okay? You know, somebody comes up to you and they say, well, you know, God's been telling me that you ought to, whatever it is. Or God's been telling me that it's okay for me to do whatever it is, even though you can go to Scripture and find out where it's not right. So you can always go to Scripture, and if anybody comes to you with that, that line, God's told me, or God's speaking to me, or whatever, and they tell you anything other than what can be authenticated in this book, somebody may be speaking to them, but it's not God. So always the true messenger authenticates his word with God's word. And this is always how we should do it also. God's true messengers will deliver God's true message. It's another thing to remember. If you're, uh, since you're all here, I hope you're not, at least in the near future, looking for a church. But if you're out there looking for a church to attend on a regular basis, the number one thing, that you, the number one criteria isn't the youth groups, not the Sunday schools, not the music. It's the message. What is the message that is being proclaimed? Is the message authenticated in God's Word? True messengers will always give a true message. Now, let me throw in one little caveat here. I believe myself to be a true messenger. I love the Lord, I love the Word, I'm committed to it. All those things, okay? But I'm not perfect. And I can be sincerely wrong. Okay? I try my best not to be. So, therefore, 
it's incumbent on you guys to look at the look at your Bibles and ask did what Pastor Darrell say today does it line up with Scripture check it out and if it doesn't come see me and say hey it looks to me like you might have been off base a little bit because I and no other human preacher is perfect so check it out you know um, Luke in Acts 17 11 encouraged the people of Berea he, he says that you're more noble than those who were in Thessalonica because you received the word eagerly <laughs> eagerly <laughs> now I'm making up new words <laughs> sure glad I told you I wasn't perfect <laughs> <laughs> because they received the word eagerly but searched the scriptures daily to see if it was so see? so be Bereans in your Christian lives check out what we preachers say because we could always be wrong a true messenger always points to Jesus always points to Jesus in John chapter 3 verse 30 John the Baptist is speaking and what does he say he says he Jesus must increase but I must decrease okay. that's what we want to do in our lives we want people to see more and more of Jesus and less and less of us okay. now we that doesn't mean that uh, we don't try to present it well we don't do our homework it, it means all the more we try to present it well and do our homework because we want people to see Jesus through what we're telling them now John we just just briefly he must have been quite a sight don't you think here's this guy and he's got all this uh, clothing has fallen apart on him and he's eating locusts and honey and comes out of the wilderness and he probably looks all scraggly and, and that and, and he's proclaiming Jesus well he, of course he doesn't want him to see him he wants him to see Jesus but he's quite a guy and that's really about all Mark says about him and then Mark moves on okay. but I do want us to note where he comes from he came out of the wilderness out of the wilderness. The wilderness is the word used there. It, it talks about a lonely, deserted, desolate, foreboding, fearful place. You ever been there? Sure you have. Not literally probably, but in your lives you've gone through times where you felt like you were in a desolate, lonely, deserted, fearful place with beasts in the land that would just love to pounce upon you and tear you limb from limb and we try our best to avoid the wilderness don't we and the wilderness experiences I do I'd much rather be here in the beautiful Northwest than be in a wilderness somewhere but when we come to Scripture we find that the wilderness seems to be the traditional meeting place with God where did Moses encounter the burning bush he was in the wilderness when God delivered his people out of Egypt he didn't bring them to the Northwest did he he took them where into the wilderness Elijah was ministered to in the wilderness and so John the Baptist comes out of the wilderness now scripture doesn't tell us what he was doing in there how he got there or any of that but I ha you have to imagine that if he is going to be the one chosen to announce the coming of the Messiah he certainly must have had some kind of a startling encounter with God so maybe we shouldn't try so hard to avoid the wilderness experiences because that's where God oftentimes really speaks to us when we're struggling when we're hurt when we're open when we're listening we're going to talk a lot more about that next week maybe you'll have a little different idea of wilderness experiences 
All right, Jesus. Back to Jesus. Because that's why we're here. Jesus is our example. I'm going to pick up where Michael left off in verse 9 of chapter 1. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately, there's our word again, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Have you ever wondered, as Christians, what is your destiny? What is it exactly you're supposed to be doing? What, what are you becoming? Well, Scripture tells us plainly, uh, Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 29, that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Every Christian's destiny is to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what we're, we're about here. And hopefully every day we're, we're becoming more and more conformed to the image of Christ. Now that means to do that, that means we have to look at him, we have to uh, see what we can uh, know about him and try to determine everything we can about who he was and what he did and what was important to him and then we conform our hopes, dreams, desires to look like his. When we do this, it will help us answer another question that is often asked by Christians, and that is simply this. Why did Jesus need to be baptized? The answer is, he didn't. He was just fine. He was perfect. He was the Son of God. He didn't need to be baptized at all. But he did it to identify with us and as an example for us. See, he makes it so easy. He says, okay, here I'm going to draw you a picture. This is what it looks like. This is how you begin your ministry. We do not need to be baptized to be saved. But we all need a time when we publicly identify ourselves with Christ as his servants to him and to the world. It is also the beginning of our ministry. See, all of you are in ministry. You realize that. Okay. So there's a time when you begin that ministry and we see that it starts with your baptism. Jesus began his earthly ministry by being baptized. That's why when I baptize folks, I always have them share something with the congregation. And some people are scared to death about that. But that's the beginning of your ministry. And hopefully for the rest of your life, you'll be telling people about Jesus or about what he's done in your life. The symbolism is very powerful. We go down in the water, we died to our sins. While we're in the water, we're cleansed. And then we rise up to new life with Jesus Christ. It's great. Another thing we see here, all three members of the Trinity are present at Jesus' baptism. Right? The heavens opened up and we hear God's voice. The Son obviously is there, since he's the object of the baptism. And the Holy Spirit is present also. It's kind of like our salvation. You think about it, that in your salvation, all three members of the Trinity are involved. God, the Father, chose us, right? There's his part. Jesus, the Son, redeems us. The Holy Spirit indwells and empowers us. It's an amazing thing. One last thing. In verse 11, Jesus had not even begun his ministry yet, and he hears these words. You are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Why is that important to you? Because at the moment 
you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, before you had done anything good or bad, God said, Behold, my beloved son or daughter, in whom I am well pleased. You know, Christians, we go through so much turmoil thinking God is displeased with us because we did this or didn't do that. But before you did or didn't do anything, He's already declaratively said, with whom I am well pleased. That's good news. That's really good news. You know, I think of Romans 9 when, you know, Jacob and Esau. And Paul says, you know, before either one had done anything good or bad. And that's the way it is with our salvation. This is so important to know. Because otherwise, Satan will drive you nuts with those thoughts of, oh, you know, now look what you've done. God is certainly displeased with you. And you know, we think, we try to think this rationally, and we think, okay, God tells me to be good, I'm bad, or I do bad, therefore God's displeased with me. But we're forgetting something. God doesn't see us. He sees Jesus when he looks at us. See, it's not our righteousness. It's Jesus Christ's righteousness that's been imputed to us. And so when God sees us, even though we've done bad things or not done good things, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he says, Behold, my beloved daughter or son, in whom I am well pleased. That's good news. That's the good news of the gospel. We are not chosen based on anything we have done. Not redeemed based on anything we have done. We are not indwelt and empowered by the Holy Spirit based on anything we have done. It's all by God's grace. So what have we learned today? I hope a few things. Or had some things reinforced that we already knew. Number one... Jesus is the Christ slash Messiah slash Savior. Those are all synonyms for each other. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. Number two, God has not left us to guess. He has given us His Word. He has given us His messengers to point us to His Word and to Him. And third, Jesus the Messiah identified himself with us so that we should identify ourselves with him. He was willing to do these things that were personally totally unnecessary for his sake, for the sake of others. Those others being us. So, we must add one more thing to our list. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, and the Servant. And we'll see over and over again how Mark presents him as such. Now if the Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Creator of the universe, will present himself to us as a servant, how much more should we present ourselves as servants of him? Pray with me, please. Lord, thank you that you came to this earth <clears throat> motivated solely by your love for us. You chose us, you redeemed us, you indwell us. You have given us the power to live the Christian life. And yet, Lord, we, we struggle, we, we trip, we stumble, we fall, we botch it up. And your response is always the same. Behold, my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. We don't understand that, but we are so thankful for it. And if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, I would just pray that right now in the quietness of your heart, you would say, Jesus, I put my faith in you. I'm a sinner and I have sinned. I confess that and ask you to be my Savior. And know that immediately He has comes into your life and gives you an irrevocable 
eternal salvation that no one can ever take from you. And now, Lord, as we go our ways this week, remind us to be inviting our friends, to be taking every opportunity to share your name with others. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.